Okay, so um, hopefully some of you have already attended uh, virtual meetings of the IETF before, but um, here's a set of instructions that we ask that you follow. Um, typically people keep their video off to conserve some uh, bandwidth. Um, muting your microphone is good because occasionally there are echoes for other problems that come up. Uh, for adding yourself to the microphone queue, we use the WebEx chat portion, which you can find in the WebEx toolbar. If you do a plus queue, that will add you to the queue. Minus queue will remove the queue and the chairs will monitor the queue. Um, we do have uh, a blue sheet to sign on the Etherpad, I believe. Yeah, I just shared the link in the chat, so please go ahead and mark your attendance. Okay, and we have a, a Jabber room going. Um, it would be great if somebody can uh, Jabber scribe. Um, we're also looking for a note taker. Mohit, did you say we have somebody who's able to take notes? Uh, yeah, so I'll be doing the Jabber scribing and uh, also maybe taking the notes, but Max Crone has uh, offered to help. So that's great, Max, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Max. You know, the more that we can get, really what we want to do is capture major, uh, you know, any sort of decisions or action items and uh, discussion points are kind of the main thing. Um, we go forward here. Uh, and this meeting will be uh, recorded as it is being now, I think. I don't know if it shows up anywhere, but in any case, uh, there is the note well, as always, this is under the standard IETF uh, IPR rules. You should be familiar with this. Uh, this kind of explains that you should need to disclose any IPR you know about uh, things that are work in progress. Um, that being said, so here we are, virtual interim, uh, May 2020. This is, I think, the first virtual interim for a uh, EMU meeting over its entire lifetime. So this is a historic event. Um, we do have an agenda. So I think we've made it through our administrivia. And we have some topics on TLS-based EAP types, some update on TPRADA, TLS-PSK, aka PS. PFS, EAP Noob, T Bruski, and then if we have time, we had a request for some agenda, agenda time on EAP peer configuration. So if we have time uh, at the end of our agenda, we'll do that. There has not been a draft submitted for that, and it's not a working group item, so we've kind of uh, put that as the low priority since this is an interim where we want to try to use it to get our uh, work done. Does anybody have any comments or questions on the agenda? Yeah, Elliot is in the queue. Go ahead, Elliot. Hi, hi you guys. Uh, good morning, good evening. Um, I think we have a duplicate agenda item here. The T. Bruski and T. Barata and updates probably should be combined. All right, awesome. So we'll just uh, put those together. When, and will you be presenting? Um, I'm going to present. I'll, I'll, I'm not going to go through the errata in detail because the person who answered them, Oleg, uh, couldn't be on the call. It's it's you know Friday evening in Jerusalem. It's not it's not exactly conducive to, to to him. But he'll he'll he can make the next one maybe. But I, I can talk about the rest of the updates. Okay, perfect. So um, when we get to that uh, section, you can just cover both of those things. And you pick whichever order you want me to present. <laughs> sure. Um, all right. Any other uh, questions on the agenda? Okay. So let's see. Do we have for TLS based EAP types? Do we have a presenter online for that? We look a little bit sparse. Is Alan online? Perfect. Um, Can we see your slides? Yeah. Um, not a lot. If you want to go to the, the next slide, there's really only one thing of, of actual content. Um, and that's, uh, you know, we seem to be okay. 
um, at least one implementer, major implementer, has said they'll do it. Um, the comments for EAPFAST seem to be okay, but it wouldn't hurt to have someone else double check that. Uh, the updates for TEEP are here for now because I think the, the other documents are gonna be a bit delayed um, and those have been reviewed and seem to be okay. So I think we're mostly pretty good. Um, it's implemented in WPA Supplicant Host AP. Um, because Uni Malinin does absolutely everything, and uh, we're working on implementing that in Preradius. So for implementers, there there are uh, open source implementations that can test against to be sure that it all works. I don't have anything else. Okay, so to clarify, so this document does contain some information about EAPFAST. Yes. And what we would be asking is that EAPFAST implementers, so I think um, uh, kind of Nancy and uh, Elliot and anybody else who has EAPFAST implementations, if we could review that part of it, because it sounds like that might belong in this document. Yes. And then um, for TEEP, we do, we, I think, Right now, the belief is those updates will go into a TEEP specific document. For me, I'm okay with it either way. It's, it's you know, they're small enough that they can go here unless Elliot has, has uh, other comments. No, I, yeah. actually, this Elliot, I apologize for uh, taking the floor. Um, the, um, I don't have a problem with Alan doing the, the, the TEEP update there and then, uh, but, but, but we should just, um, get to the TEEP discussion because there are other issues. Um, the one question I had for Alan is, um, I don't. I looked over your document and thought it was really good, and I'm glad you wrote it. Um, the only question I had was, did you handle the restart in TEEP, which is really it, 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 it's quite sort of linked to uh, TL, uh, early versions of TLS, um, as in the the fast session resumption? Yeah. Uh, I believe that's there. I'll, I'll, I'll double check it. Um, okay. So I guess what, one of the things we're looking for is reviewers to kind of make sure that, uh, we have, uh, the EAPFAST stuff correct and the TEEP stuff correct. Um, so I need a couple people to volunteer or either here or on the list to to kind of provide a review. I can certainly tackle T, but I'm not I'm not an eat fast expert. But I can see if Oleg will, will be willing to to tackle uh, eat fast. I mean, I, awesome. I can try and take a look at it too. Awesome. Yeah, that that would be helpful just to make sure. Take we... a look at it too. Awesome. Yeah, that that would be helpful just to make sure we. That is some echo. Some echo. Uh oh. All right. So I think once we have that, uh, some of you know, a good review of this document, we can probably start bringing it to uh, working group last call to see if we can move it forward. I think we do want to make sure we get some review of these things first. All right, Alan, anything else you want to cover? Nope, I think that's it. Awesome. So if we go back to the agenda, Keep errata and others. Do I have, so um, if we look at whichever one you, do we have slides for uh, both of these? Up. I sent you slides a little a few minutes before the meeting. Okay. So are they uploaded yet? Do you know? Let's see. Do we see them here? Mohit, do you have the ability to upload? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that in a in a second. So then, yeah, 
Uh, yeah, they're in the email 554, so. We could give you the, you could take the ability to present, Elliot, if you want to do that. Want to do that. You guys can upload them as, as, as you go, okay? Let me have them. That's good. Thanks. Right, let's just see. There are two many slides here, so it'll be. But I think it this will be sort of funny because I think we'll find at least some of it amusing. Okay, so um, you know, you know, people noticed that that. Oh, sorry, there's an echo. If you're um, if you're um, if you're not presenting, could you mute? You're not. That would be neat. Okay. Um. So great. Um, you'll notice that there's not a, a draft update yet. Um, basically, uh, uh, I, I took the philosophy that before we do the draft update, update we had better have some really good, a really decent implementation available um, of both client and server to try and you know play around with. Um, and you know, doing that without code is is hazardous. And I want to talk about why. <laughs> All right, so um, I started to implement the PKCS 10. Um, in fact, I'm just about done implementing the PKCS 10 uh, packet format for in, in TEEP. It, it says you can have you can do PKCS 10, you can have a, a PKCS 7 response, and all this is great. Um, but um, okay, when I went and looked at actually doing PKCS 10, um, I looked at the references. And uh, they're actually calling for um, uh, a reference to Ike, which I think is 49.5 or 4549. I always get the numbers backwards, uh, or the, the RFC number. Um, and it's in this one section, it's reference like 6.4 of, of this document. So I go and I look it up. And sure enough, you know, yeah, they're using enveloped PEM or something that looks like that, right? For, um, uh, for PKCS 10 formatted message. Uh, to go across the layer at, L, at, at layer two. Um, and I actually, you know, this is, it's not hard to implement this, right? OpenSSL has all the code to do this. And sure enough, I, I did it. Um, and that's not so much a problem, except it's a wasteful bandwidth. Um, so then I go to implement PKCS7. And the first thing I discovered was that the PKCS7 TLD isn't PKCS7. It's CMS. Um, and that's because the reference is to CMS down here. Uh, and the encoding isn't this. It isn't a PEM encoding, it's binary dir. So for those who are keeping track of the, the situation, we're shipping up uh, upstream uh, a sort of PEM like message and downstream dir. And then the downstream is supposed to be PKCS7 because that's what everything says, but the reference is to CMS. That's because CMS obsoletes PKCS7. Okay, then we probably, the, the big question, Russ. <laughs> no, it's just terminology, right? That's why everything in CMS is called a P7C or whatever. So good that you're on the call. I'm glad you, you joined just in time because I have a question for you. Because, you know, I literally discovered, you know, I, I discovered this yesterday or the day before as I was doing the code. Um, and my question for you is, is the envelope, is the binary, envelope, the binary structure for a bag of certs for PKCS7 different in any way than the binary, uh, the, than the bag of certs for, um, for CMS? No, they're exactly the same. So this is merely, um, it, 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 we, th this is barely even an errata, if it is. Right. right? It, it's like when somebody says SSL and they mean TLS. It's the same issue. <laughs> because that's not the case for other parts of CMS versus There's PKCS. only one place, and that's in the, in the content. Well, CMS has had things added, and the version number has been updated to reflect it. But the only difference is the octet wrapper are in um, content info. In content, yes. Explained in, content the, in the uh, RFC. Okay. So um, I actually like this format. I think it's fine, but 
Um, another discussion has been raised about, great, what do you do when you get one of these things? Um, and there's a, a, a sort of a discussion going on in the, um, on the open SSL list as well, how do you store these darn things? And, you know, don't worry about that um, in the IETF because it's not on the wire, but I'll just raise this as something that, as an implementation issue that um, was just also identified this week on, in a separate context, which is um, you have to store these things some, in some way other than DIR probably um, when, you, when, when you put them to disk uh, because uh, the ability to ma manipulate DIR in OpenSSL, there, there are at least some limitations there. Again, it's an implementation issue. It's not so much a protocol issue, um, but it is something um, that, that sort of came up. This I is- thought there were, so, but Elliot, for PKCS7 and stuff, hi, this is Sean Turner. Um, I thought that there were already like file extensions defined in the whole nine yards and a MIME content type in the whole shoot and match. There are. Um, it's just that the, the tooling isn't, in some cases, isn't up to the job. Um, and, and that's okay. Like, you know, again, we, we do the protocol, we, we do the wire protocol stuff. The, the actual open SSL code, you know, in, 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 in is not what we write to, right? But I'm just noting that oh, this- I agree. You know, this was identified, you know, earlier this week. Um, and you can, you know, if you're on the open SSL users list, you'll see the messages being discussed in a, in a different context. Um, so this is, so, so these are sort of, this is a little bit of an inconsistency, the PKCS 10 format versus the PKCS 7 format. Um, the other issue that we ran into um, is the request action frame. Um, it's not necessarily the easy, the, the it's not clear what it means to be honest. Read seventy-one seventy. Um, we know what we want it to mean, but it, but it isn't that. Um, I should explain what we want and who we is. Um, the we is uh, 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 Owen and I who have been looking at this. Um, what we want is a lockstep protocol, which says where, where the server can say, "Hey, client, can you can you can you send me one of these frames filled out?" One of these TLDs filled out. Um, that's what we want. But the request action frame actually requires that you send a full TLD, the type, the length, and the value. Um, and so, if if I send a if I send a client a request action frame that contains a, a, a short length of of just the size of the type um, and no value as part of a request action frame, understand it. And it just says that you should process it. But what does that mean? So there's th this, this discussion here in, in section four of 7170 leave, leaves one a little bit unsatisfied. Um, and so we have choices. Like one possibility is that we say, well, if it, if it has a, a zero length, if, if the length only covers the type, then the type is the only thing you care about. In which case, the intent there is that the client should um, try to send to the server uh, a TLD. And if it can't, it should fall with the, it, it, should, it should use the failure action that is given as part of the request action frame. But that's what we'd like. It's not what it says. And so as part of the update, we should probably clarify this. Now, the other possibility is, oh heck, you know, Yoni's already using the request action frame in context, in, in, just as it's written. TLVs are cheap. We could just define a new TLV for what it is we want, um, which is what I just described. And so that's one possibility. The other possibility is, well, really, um, we shouldn't even bother to do what we want because what we want is wrong. Um, and the reason it might be wrong is suppose uh, that there is an op that there's a TLV that we want the client to process, but it needs parameters from the server. Then you'd like something more complex, in which case you need to pass more information. So these are sort of the issues that we're, we're, we're addressing. I personally lean a little bit towards the approach that we, that the, the, the approach that I said we wanted, which is that we'd like to say here are some some ionotypes that we'd like the client that we'd like the peer to send back to us um, 
completed. And if it can't, then indicate um, the, 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 the then, then process um, indicate a failure mode based on what the, what the request action frame tells you to indicate. Let me stop there. Any questions? Because that was a, that was a lot that I just discussed right there. More comments, and I'm not looking at the chat, so I have no idea what's going on in the chat, if anything. I, I don't see anybody in the in the chat. Um, I think you know there. What I think would help is is to have some discussion on the list, and like if you could. You know, describe the use case because it's not really clear. You know, there, there's. I think it's a fairly detailed discussion of what you're trying to do and whether request action. You know, as you say, is the right mechanism or not. If it is the right mechanism, it sounds like we should probably clarify. You know, we should figure out what's the the best way to address it. Whether it's clarifying the behavior so that you can do what you want, or or maybe what you're trying to do really is something else. But it. Sounds like it's fairly close to request action, but I think we'd want to have that discussion with the, with the more more details so that uh, we can figure out what what it looks like. So, Joe, I actually did put a message out on the list. Um, in fact, um, there were a couple. Of, so, one of those wonderful moments where Cisco was arguing with Cisco, um, if you will, um, on, on 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 this. And um, no, we're not religious about this either, Oleg or me. Um, in terms of how to resolve it, but we would like some comments and some thought on it. Um, what this leads up to, though, in conjunction with the errata, uh, and you'll notice that I haven't covered the errata because Oleg did, and he didn't get any, he didn't get a lot of feedback from anybody on the list um, regarding the errata, because he posted responses to each and every one of the errata. So, um, and I'm not going to try and do my, my Oleg imitation um, on this. But there were a couple of areas where we know that there were some issues, um, and and clearly the errata. I think all of the, all of them get to be verified in some way, shape, or form. But just verifying them isn't enough. We have to actually have the text uh, really clear. Um, but if you look at like uh, Yoni's code, for instance, um, one of the good examples is well, what if you don't have an inner method? And our use case that we have for IoT is that in general you wouldn't have an inner method. You're not going to have an inner eat method in T. You're going to basically, you know, the, the goal here is under normal circumstances, T will behave almost identically to um, eat TLS. And occasionally the server will say things like, uh, okay, renew your certificate. Um, or, okay, um, we'd like you to do a rat test attestation when that TLB gets defined, right? Or somebody else might want, you know, have something else they want the client to do. Um, that we haven't thought of because, you know, it just hasn't struck our imaginations yet. Um, and we like that lock, lockstep approach, but on the, in the general case, you know, I, we, we still, we don't see a need for IoT at least for there to be an inner method. So um, this MSK issue is one that absolutely has to get resolved. What the, and, and this further leads up to the question of, given the amount of changes that we're talking about, should we bump the version of T? as we do these fixes. So that's, you know, th those are the, the questions that, that I have. With that, I'll stop. Questions, comments? Hi, so this is Mohit. Uh, like we have three different uh, deep related issues. So one is, of course, fixing the TP rata and that that's uh, of course critical. Then there's the question of how does TP work with TLS 1.3, uh, and then there is uh, the third uh, question of TP new usage of TP for Brewski IoT and and other things, and uh, perhaps uh, repurposing this request action frame or or defining a new TLV. And I'm wondering like where and how this is all organized is a little bit unclear to me. So it might help like for the team experts to sit down and agree, like we are going to have, have two documents. This is where this goes and this is where that goes because uh, I, I mean, personally, I think having uh, deep 
the 7170 with TLS 1.3 and all the errata fixed could be one document and then these updates uh, T portion 2 could be a separate RFC but that's yeah I, I guess up to you, to you uh, the deep experts so I'm hoping that Joe, Yoni and others can like go through the errata and then somehow we could reach like some sort of uh, conclusion on this because they have been open and there have been comments but we haven't closed them yeah so uh, okay two points um first to tim c um thanks for for the comment i agree we shouldn't we, we what we shouldn't do is say you 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 must not have an inner method right it's just that it has to, the, the, the mechanism should work both for when there is an inner method and when there isn't an inner method. And right now, there's confusion about what happens when there isn't an inner method. Um, and so that's, that's what needs to get fixed. Um, to your point, Mohi, um, I don't see a whole lot of value from an IoT perspective of implementing TEAT until we um and, 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 and until we clear up all of this so the more documents we have the more of a mess it will make to me i i'm very comfortable with alan handling uh 1.3 um because if he especially if he's already done it and he's already done fast restart it's an area where i don't have a lot of experience and and he does and so um i'm comfortable with with him doing that in fact if we do bump the version, what I would want to do is basically nab his code, because this is going to take a while to do. Um, and um, so, or nab his text later on for the for the update. So, my my view is let's just do one document because one document is more than I can handle in terms of meet at least the amount of writing that I would want to do. Um, and and let Alan's document continue as it is with with Teep in it because if he's got the the work already done. Uh, why should we why, why should we stop that fix right it's it's good work let's let's just keep going yeah i mean the lesser the documents the better for me i mean there's less things to review read and and send to the isg uh, I, I i guess then my slight preference is to even have those one or three update in in your single document because there isn't any way I can implement TEEP with TLS 1.3 until I know what to do with the data. So if if you want to take the wall and have it in a single document, that's fine by me. Uh, I, I was just thinking the fewer places those things are, the, the better then. But again, like no strong preferences. What, what, so the, I think the order of operations here is, first of all, somebody needs to actually look at Oleg's message and, if, and, and either verify or reject the errata. Because we, you know, he's done that work. If we can, if, if we can have those, if we can have the errata verified, rejected, discussed, whichever. Um, Joe, you did a good round um, one time. If you could take a second pass, that would be very helpful. I'll, I'll commit to doing that. Okay. And then if Yoni, if somebody can poke Yoni just to see if he's comfortable with Oleg's answers, then I'd say we have ourselves a ball game. And if those errata are verified, then people can do what they were going to do with T. We're going to, you know, with, with the existing version and use that, use that to move forward. I'll start, you know, I have a question in my own head as to, you know, do we bump the version? I'm inclined to do so just to clean up some of the, um, some of the text. You know, how important is that? Most important thing, I think, is that we get the request action frame correct. Um, you'll notice I didn't discuss the Brewski um, frames. Those are actually the easiest ones to do because um, they're really just piping through. Um, but we have to we have other things that we have to look at still with PKACS10. There are a couple of like corner cases that I didn't discuss. Uh, for instance, there is a form of channel binding that is suggested in 7170, um, which um, I wanted, which I think requires review as part of this as well. Um, so I expect we'll be um, I expect I expect we have a good bit of work to do in terms of um, all of these these uh, the, the fixing the the just PKCS ten and, and getting PKCS seven um, implemented and comfortable and um, if we it, it sounds like that would be the the best plan to go forward with.
Yeah, that sounds great. So I'll mark in the minutes that uh, Joe and uh, Jorge will review the resolution to Irata filed by Oleg. So awesome. we can then, then try to close. That sounds good. Okay, thank you. And as far as uh, TLS, I mean, as far as updating the version, I think we need to see what the changes look like. And, you know, I, I don't think there are a lot of implementations out there, but if we are going to make, um, you know, breaking changes, then we probably should bump the version. Yeah, it is not necessary to, to I mean, unless we redefine what, um, I, either the PKCS 10 format or the, um, uh, or, or the, uh, 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 which one call it, the, the request action frame. It's not necessary to bump the version, but I think we probably want to clean those up. So that's really the discussion that I think we should, we should have as we get the draft. And if people are comfortable with this way forward, what I'll do is I'll put forward a draft with Jim and Nancy and Owen that really looks a lot like the old TEEP RFC, but has a lot of this stuff cleaned up. Cool. Okay. Now, just before I, I leave the, the floor, I'll also mention that when you see that, we'll include the, the, one of the things that seems important, at least for some IoT uses, is to have a CSR attributes uh, message. This is present in RFC 7030 and absent in, um, in TEEP, and it's an inconsistency that we need to clean up. And um, so we'll add that as well. And then we'll look at the Brewski stuff as we go forward. But less important than I think getting TEEP cleaned up a bit more. Okay, any other questions or comments for uh, Elliot? Thanks for your time. Okay, is uh, Yari on, or no, who's going to talk about TLS PSK? Yeah, that, that would be me, unless John decided to show up. He's on, on kid leave, so I think uh, I'll take the ball and, and present. Uh, so yeah, basically before the IETF that was planned to be in March, uh, John, I, Thomas, and Owen uh, submitted a draft which basically doesn't have much content and, and only headers. Uh, try, trying to answer the question or trying to start with the version that uh, specifies how how to do PSK authentication with EPLS. Um, Joe, if you can go to the next slide. So, even though RFC 5216, uh, which is the original EPLS specification, doesn't explicitly forbid uh, PSK authentication, it it does say in, in section 211 that uh, the server must, inc uh, must include TLS server certificate handshake message and a server hello done handshake message must be the last. So kind of, even though it doesn't explicitly rule out PSK, it, it was uh, uh, implicitly implying that PSK authentication isn't supported. And the, the, the updated draft uh, to work with TLS 1.3 now explicitly says that PSK authentication shall not be used except for assumption. And one of the reasons was uh, the comments from Bernardo Boba saying that EPLS with certificates in, is used in many high security applications, you know, in, in the US and and it, he doesn't want the EPTLS method type to be mixed with other forms of uh, credentials. So there was a general consensus that uh, we do require PSK authentication but it should be kept separate from uh, eptls with certificates and that that was the reason that we started 
this work in a, in a separate document. Uh, if you go to the next slide. So why do we need PSK? I think uh, uh, there, there's, uh, I'm not going to spend much time in justifying this uh, because we, while we do have Veep PSK without the TLS, uh, it does not provide identity protection and perfect forward secrecy. So it's it's better to like use a modern protocol like TLS 1.3 for doing PSK authentication. And there is EAP password, uh, which is good if you're if you have low entropy uh, user entered passwords. But it it does require a PAC, and uh, currently CFRG is running a PAC selection process. So. We, we should rather wait for that. And uh, at least the e-password has uh, some side channel protections that may not be suitable on IoT devices. So to counter these side channel attacks, uh, it uh, it requires some extra computation which may not be suitable. So that, that's the reason we want to do EAP TLS 1.3 PSK authentication inside EAP. Uh, CFRG if has finished that process. Selections are made now. They're working on the documents. The document, the two. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. That, that's true. So the selection is done, but we still don't have have RFC with the actual pick. But yeah. Uh, point noted. Yeah. And I, I think even even when we have that, we would still want to have uh, EAP TLS PSK. So yeah, I think having that pick for user entered. Passwords is 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 fine, and when that's done, we can see if if there is a need. Actually, I'll I have that on on the next slide. So, do uh, if you go to the next slide. Uh, so when we submitted the document, uh, no, yeah, that that's fine. So no, no, just if you go back once. So yeah, so. Uh, when we submitted this document, there was a discussion on the list that PSK is not the only credential type that, that is supported by TLS. So of course, PSK itself uh, implies whether you do PSK key exchange or PSK with Diffie-Hellman for perfect forward secrecy, then Russ has an RFC on uh, doing uh, auth authentication with external PSKs while also using so certificates there is a couple of individual drafts. Uh, one is on this quantum relief with TLS and Kerberos, basically using some form of Kerberos tickets with TLS. And then Hunters has this draft on CBOR web tokens in, in TLS and DTLS. So the thing is that if you are going to do uh, EAP TLS PSK authentication, what about these other uh, variations of credentials type that are either currently supported by, by TLS 1.3 or may in the future come and uh, uh, yeah, now you can go to the next slide. So there's the question, uh, more fundamental question before we begin specifying if TLS 1.3 PSK is, is do we only want to do it for PSK or do we want to have a generic TLS, uh, tunneling method and then any credential type that TLS currently supports or might support in future is, is supported. So uh, I listed pros and cons of both. So if we only do EPTLS PSK, it's more easier to handle. Uh, we'll need, uh, like we can provide better guidance on what, what's the relationship between PSK identity and the NI. We can probably like tailor uh, the specification for IoT deployments, like get rid of code that provides fragmentation support and like we can be more specific. Uh, on the other hand, this this might later come back to bite us if there is a lot of new credential types that are supported with TLS, including CBOR web tokens, then we'll have a new EAP method type for each of them. So we'll, we'll have several documents and several method types. I mean, we are not running out of the EAP method space yet, but that that's a, that's, uh, uh, like question for all of you to answer. What what do you feel? And knowing that some of these drafts are currently individual submissions, so I'm not sure they might like change dramatically. And and I'm not sure how much interest there would be to like bring those credential support those credential types in EAP. So and also like there will be less scope of tailoring implementations if we have like a 
generic keep TLS everything other than client and server certificates. Go ahead. Um, thanks, thanks for presenting this. Um, the only question I have um, is that ETLS 1.3, well, excuse me, TLS 1.3 specifies in the credential object that the, that the credential can be either a certificate or a naked public key. Um, when we did the T, when we did ETLS 1.3, did we hold to allow for both? Did you mean a, uh, a PSK or a naked public key? Naked public did, key. Did I hear you? Uh, no, we we have only specified for certificates. So uh, yeah, no no raw public keys. So we we should probably. I mean, I think it's probably. I would like, if possible, for us to track TLS, right? So that you know, if somebody wants to use naked public keys, they can. Right, and so I think if, I don't know about everything under the sun, TLS. But adding back the, the support for the naked public keys that's already specified in TLS 1.3, that seems to me to be a very reasonable thing to do. Sure, yeah. I mean, would that be in this document that does PSK and... Yeah, I don't know if that, if you call it just a PSK document, but you say in this th yeah. fourth bullet, right, eat TLS, everything other than basic client and, and, and certain certificates. So I, I sort of fit that into that bullet. Right. Okay. So then we'll have like, uh, yeah, as it is currently. So we'll have one document for eat TLS with client and server certificates, and then another one with basically PSK and uh, raw public keys to begin with, and you don't really have an opinion about others. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm not a big fan of everything under the sun approach. But, um, but certainly that particular one, given that it was specified by the TLS working group, there's good reason that they did specify it, um, which is that you don't have to have a full PKI blown out to, to do um, to do public private key pairs. Um, I understand their, their, their purpose there. You know, and, and it seems to me that we should try and hold as closely as we can to uh, to, to their document and, their, and its structure um, where possible. And, and so that the use cases that they have in mind are also supported at the lower levels. Understood. Go ahead, Joe. I, I just think we want to be careful about opening up or just trying to accommodate all the use cases. Not that I, so I think raw public keys is fine. It's not a comment to that, but just in general, this comment of everything under the sun, I think we really want to try to get the group to focus on what are the really the, the modes that are going to be important for the EP use cases um, and not try to cover all of them. Um, unless like, I mean, if, if we comes out that, Hey, we, we just need to, then, then perhaps that is the right thing to do, but I'd rather see us, you know, focus on a few things and make sure that we understand them and we understand how they're going to be implemented and used so we can document the right guidance for using them. Um, yeah, I. I tend to agree. I think it's better to have something more specific and concrete that we know works rather than having some drafts which which might be moving targets. So uh, yeah, Russ has a comment. Go ahead, Russ. I do think the PSK with certificates needs to be supported. And it's, you know, Bernard doesn't seem to want to put that in ETLS, even though I think it meets the same authentication model um, that is already in EPTLS. So my question is, where does it go? Um, I think the uh, the concerns that people have about the the uh, post quantum I, support is important. I think we could. Uh, I, I at least I am open to addressing it in this new document we are working on. Uh, I don't see any reason why we we shouldn't do that. I mean, your document is already an RFC, so it's not like a moving target. Uh, we know uh, what are the new extensions. So 
at least I, 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 I am open to having it in, in this document. Uh, so we'll do then PSK, the raw public key, and then PSK with certificates. If that's fine, then uh, let's agree to that. I think Roman's also in the queue. Hi, yeah, this is Roman. I just wanted to, to reiterate, I mean, if we have a choice between what to put in or everything to put in, I would let what the implementation community is willing to write code around drive what we do. And if we need to make updates later, let's do that. But let's focus on the things that, you know, the community wants to kind of build tooling around. Understood. I think we seem to have a consensus that everything under the sun is not really the best way to move yeah we'll work on that so we'll do the psk raw public keys and and psk with certificates and i and i think roman's point is really good just in the context of you know where we are with teep and having a lack of implementation at the time we were developing teep you know really did not help us so the more we can move forward with implementation uh guiding us the better uh, we have an implementation of uh, eptls 1.3 with psk uh, of course it currently doesn't do this psk with certificates but that's something we can look into doing doing that so yeah i mean we have one implementation it's it's early prototypes which was basically to uh, guide uh, guide us while writing the draft so and yeah it's open source and so on so yeah Sounds, sounds good. I uh, will update the draft based on the discussions here and present it at the next meeting. Unless there is anything else, I'm, I'm done. Yeah. Any other comments for our Mohit? Do we have somebody who can give an update on AKA PFS? I know there was a new draft, probably just a refresh posted. Does anybody have? Yes, this is Yari. I can there talk we go, about Yari. that briefly. And I'll also post uh, the link to the diff uh, for the new draft on the chat room or on the chat room. And uh, I don't actually have a whole lot to say. I have one one issue that I do want to discuss a little bit and get your feedback. Um, but from my perspective, this draft has been in relatively stable state uh, for a while. And one issue that we did have uh, was uh, what we discussed in ITF 106 uh, was this like, you know, should we have uh, more than one? algorithm slash group slash curve um, is only one now defined um, and and then there's a question of like how how, how does that get uh, actually where is the registry and what are the details and you know what is mandatory what is optional and so forth so so in this update because I, I did have to do this week uh, a refresh just for the sake of uh, avoiding the expired draft situation but I also added uh, a, a proposed fix or proposed extension to this um, issue of just having one one curve. And so we, we previously had the uh, uh, two five five nineteen there, and just now I added the uh, NIST P two five six. And the draft talks about both of those points to the relevant documents. Um, and it does say that the uh, 2519 is required and the other one is uh, optional. Now, <clears throat> this is very early uh, proposal for the working group. So it's basically sort of a Stroman proposal from my side uh, for addressing this part of the discussion. And um, looking forward to your comments, uh, basically, it could be of any nature, like you know, we don't need this other thing at all, or or we need a specific number, like one or two or three. So now there's another like one alternative uh, thing. 
Um, and also, I, I, I can't claim that I'm at all sort of aware of the details of this uh, uh, NIST uh, curve or, or group. And so it, it might be that my specification of what actually is said there about the details is wrong. So I, I would request you to take a look and give some feedback either now or, or later. Again, the link was on the chat room. And uh, Mohit and I were also struggling today a little bit to find the exact correct reference for E256. And so what, what the draft actually ended up doing is to refer to this uh, uh, SEC2 version 2, which is uh, from the SEC group. Um, that, that is, I, I think, no longer active. But even this year, we published RFCs that refer to that spec. So. Maybe that's right, or maybe there's something else that we should be referring to. That that's an, another area of comments. That if, if you like this idea of E two five six to begin with, then uh, then maybe you want to take a look at if our references are right or, or wrong. Well, I'll, I'll leave it here. Uh, Mohit, do you have anything to add from our discussions today? Um, no, I think we have a couple of people in the queue. So I don't know, Joe. Did you have something to? Comment. No, I think we should uh, take the quick questions from the queue. Yeah, Ross, go ahead. Hi. Uh, so, yes, I like the addition of P256. Um, and I think you should point to the NIST document. Um, i sure I can uh, forward you a reference. The uh, I was looking the, for one, but couldn't find <laughs> one. That's not draft. Oh, uh, yeah, there is. Uh, Anyway, the the uh, they are end up being the same, but I think the the NIST one is uh, the more frequently referenced one. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think Elliot was in the queue and then said he what Russ said. So um, yeah, so I haven't had a chance to look at it yet, but um, I think this is you know it's it's. Sounds like a good addition. I would encourage people to review this because this is one of the uh, working group items that we have and we'd like to get something out so that uh, maybe 3GPP could make use of it. Yeah, and uh, it's just a sort of small follow on. So um, my idea is that you know, perhaps we could just solve this issue one way or the other and then uh, Move forward with the draft and submit it to the last calls and such. Um, I did have one more question to to uh, Russ and Elliot and others who might have opinions. Like, are you, I mean, if you're happy with P two five six, but do you think one alternate is is the right number, or, or did you want to have other ones as well? I don't have an opinion on this. I leave it to Russ. I, I'm happy with the two you've got. Uh, is are you going to set up an IANA registry so that more could be added? You know, five years from now. Yeah, the the new version of the draft has that. Or I mean, there was a registry already previously, but now I have two entries. Not, not yeah. One. So I think it starts with two. That's fine. Other questions for Yari? All right, thanks, Yari. Um, let's see, do we have a presentation on Noob? Thomas, yes. do you have slides? Let's, uh, uh, let me see if I yeah, already should go. Yeah, the last slides. Already. Okay. All so right. So we now have the EAP Noob as the working group draft, and uh, I'll just uh, uh, want to basically, well, I'll have a few slides of overview and to recall what it is, and then uh, um, the remaining slides are kind of questions what to do next. Uh, so next slide. So basically, this is... Um, uh, an out-of-band authentication method uh, for EAP, and the, the, the reason to 
do it is that there is no such solution, but out of band authentication is commonly needed and used. Next slide. And um, um, basically, to kind of recall what is the uh, design, what ideas they have been here in the design. So it's a EAP method with a focus on bootstrapping smart devices out of the box without any professional administration. And um, the method used there is this user assisted out of band authentication, such as the, the user action could be, for example, scanning a dynamic QR code or uh, uh, NFC tag. And uh, I should emphasize that they are dynamic tags or codes, not static printed ones in this protocol. And in addition to just authenticating the device once, EAP Noob registers the device to AAA. So that's where it differs from, uh, I guess, all other EAP methods that it does this initial registration uh, also while authenticating for the first time. And then we have this uh, fast reauthentication using the association created on the, uh, at the first instance. Okay, next slide. And uh, this slide kind of uh, is to explain how the protocol works. There is uh, basically a Diffie-Hellman exchange, which is authenticated with an out of band message. But we can get this out of band message to be a relatively short one uh, by doing the most of the communication in band over EAP. And uh, that's the trick that EAP allows the unauthenticated device to talk to a server somewhere in the back end on the cloud. And then uh, if we want with radius routing, we can move that endpoint to anywhere where we want. Um, and here in this picture, the user basically would scan a QR code. Uh, well, once the key exchange is done, scan a QR code and, and uh, deliver that. Uh, the QR code contains a URL, deliver that to the cloud server, and uh, then the, uh, maybe log in there. And uh, then the device would be registered in the AAA server in the cloud um, with, with that user's account associated with it. Okay, so that was the overview and then the status of things. So uh, this shows the timeline. Uh, the latest action is basically the working group adoption and uh, there were just minor editorial updates to that version. Um, and uh, then the next slides are basically questions to you, kind of what to do next. Uh, so let's see the next, or maybe there is another status slide, yeah. So this is just to, to kind of recall that uh, they, we have been working on this for quite a few years now, and uh, uh, there's an implementation that a little bit lags the drafts, but is again being updated, at, uh, kind of a version of it is being updated. And then we have done formal modeling of the protocols and uh, about the protocol and the security of it. Okay, so next slide. So what we, what I think needs to be done next is here is some concrete things. One is uh, this uh, same issue that Yari had, that there is just one um, curve specified currently and one cipher suit uh, with, no, a uh, crypto suit. I'm not sure why I called it. It's called crypto suit in the draft. So we have a crypto suit that is, uh, has this uh, curve 25519 and SHA-256. I guess I should call it, actually, we should call it X25519 to be pedantic. And um, but, but while we have only just one uh, crypto suit, um, what can, um, yeah, we, we can't really test the code um, for um, updating crypto suits, which is part of the protocol and something that we spend a lot of time uh, modeling formally and have kind of shown that it should be correct, but it's not being testing in, tested in practice. And there I would be happy to get suggestions of uh, which curve to use. Is it this P256 that is the favorite or um, something, of course, that is kind of commonly in use and, and uh, where the code is easy to get. And uh, then once we have that, then testing the cipher suit updates 
um, that that with the implementation that it actually works. I think the code is not really tested, so it's not going to run just like that. And um, then uh, another detail is this renumbering of the protocol messages because it, there's been some evolution over the last few years and in the draft, and uh, the message numbering is not exactly logical. So uh, I think it might make sense to renumber the messages before. Uh, well, while we can still kind of uh, get the implementers to do it and have them in a logical order. And then, of course, the implementation needs to be kept up to date with the current draft, which uh, is now, again, I think, going reasonably well. Um, okay, so those, I think, are kind of easy questions. Then the next step, next slide, that is the last slide. So then uh, my kind of overall overall question is what else do we need to do uh, to this draft to make progress and, and get to the working group last call eventually? Uh, some things that I guess we do need is the, we need some reviews on the just the general quality of the draft and the security of the security protocol. And uh, then we need an EAP method number from IANA. And then uh, this, it's been agreed already previously that we need to change the, uh, the uh, domain name that is used in the NAI from the current EAP do, noob .net to something that ends with ARPA. And there's a question kind of what name should we use? Noob.arpa or EAP noob.arpa or do we actually want like a hierarchical namespace for noob.eap.arpa? I don't have really an opinion on that, but someone else might have. Okay, so those are the kind of questions. I guess the uh, the two kind of questions where it would be nice to have a input right away is the, uh, which curve and hash function to choose for the second crypto suit, and also uh, on which what kind of ARPA name to choose. We have uh, Mohit in the queue. Yeah, I was just noting that Ross and Eduardo would like to see P256 as the second curve. That's probably the sensible choice. So uh, we should do that. Uh, I think I, I have been, I am still a co-author, but I was only involved in this work early on. And I have seen this uh, draft evolve. So the message numbers have gone from one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then there was a message number zero, and I wasn't sure if you're going to now add minus one as the new message number, or is it going to be nine? So uh, reordering them now makes sense, knowing that you know at some point there may be need for like new new message types, but uh, like starting cleanly now makes sense when it's still not like uh, RFC yet. Um, I, I guess. Uh, both Joe and I can help you, uh, I can put you in touch with Diana to get the EAP number. I'm not sure about the NI. I think maybe Roman or Joe have, have some opinion. And I guess we can ask for early reviews from uh, e either a or the security directorate, the IoT directorate, or, or perhaps bo both of them, because otherwise I, I agree that uh, you know, this draft has has been worked on for a couple of years or since 2016, so it's pretty stable otherwise. Maybe I didn't catch. Can you restate the additional review we want to get? Uh, yeah, I was just saying that the, the draft is, as Thomas mentioned, is uh, pretty mature and stable, so we can uh, this is just a suggestion. We can ask for early reviews from the security directorate and IoT directorate. So I'm not saying we should do last call yet. Uh, I think there's still this message renumbering things that should be sorted, but I don't see any reason why we can't send it to the directorates for an early review. Oh, definitely. I completely agree. And I think, Thomas, you can also use this time to 
like figure out the EAP method number. I think Joe, you are the expert on the registry, so perhaps you can help him, but not sure about the IAB domain name allocation. Yeah, I think we'll have to put in a request for an early assignment, but we can, we can handle that. And I think Elliot had put me in touch with Wes, so I did inform him about this request for domain names for both uh, Brewski and Noob. And Wes Hardiker from the IAB is currently studying the draft, so I guess we'll hear at some point. So let's wait until we get back an answer from, from the IAB about this domain name reservation. Um, Elliot, did you have a? Yeah, just on the, the last point, what, what Wes said um, in particular was that he would not be disposed to do an early allocation of, of this sort of thing. But um, on the question in the, in, in, on the slide, I think it's very likely that Noob is the first of several methods that will need this sort of thing. So. Um, you know, go with the right side rather than the left side there, you know, in terms of uh, I think they want to pollute all the dot ARPA uh, space, they're probably just going to want to have a simple name. And I don't think we have a formal request to the IAB yet on this. So that's something that chairs have to just drive. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, this noob.eve.arpa was something that I also suggested to, to Wes, but then he sent back to me that this would require setting up the sub subdomain and the zone for .eep. So yeah, I don't have a preference either way. And I agree that Noob is one of several that will request this special use domain. So uh, yeah, let's let's wait and, and see for the IAB to come back to us on, on this. Yeah, it, it could be, um, Mohit, that there's a little bit of confusion there. On, on Wes's part, we should just make clear, we're not asking for any sort of zone support. We just want the name, uh, we, we just want the hierarchical name reserved, that's all. Right, right, I, I don't think none, any of these names should actually, like any DNS server should respond to this. So I, I did explain this situation to Wes. Uh, maybe this is a question to Joe and Roman, do we like, is there an official way of like sending a request to IAB or how, how does it work? If it goes from the ISG to the IAB. Right, I mean, it would be right. If we want to do the official process, I mean, the other piece of help I can provide is I can push for to make sure we just get the, the uh, an unofficial answer because you know the more formalism we bring, it just ultimately brings delay. So I'm happy to take that. I mean, I can oh. talk to Wes. Okay, yeah, that yeah. would be great. Yeah, sure, happy to do so. Okay, so I guess we do early directorate reviews. Thomas will get in touch with Aina for the method number and Roman helps us with the domain name. I guess we okay, are thank done. You. Thank you yeah. so much. Any other questions for Thomas? Right. We did have a, we have some time left and we had another request for review or uh, for a presentation. So this is Sandeep, I think I saw you on the call. Hi everyone. So this is the first time I'm, uh, I'm here. So uh, this is uh, not as a presentation, uh, not as a uh, draft yet. So this work we haven't and done any uh, draft so far. So this is more like uh, uh, what are the things that we are currently doing and what are the things that we are uh, facing together with this uh, EAP method. So can we move to our next slides? Can somebody hear me? Yes, we can hear you, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So uh, currently we are, uh, we, I mean, uh, me, me together with my colleague at Huawei. So we are looking at different uh, IoT bootstrapping uh, 
methods for bootstrapping devices, resource consuming devices or IoT devices, which we call uh, simple device uh, together together with this, uh, more resourceful devices such as mobile phones and we currently use out of band channel to transfer some information which is later used uh, uh, during uh, which is used to secure bootstrapping process through in band channel and by uh, bootstrapping we mean uh, which involves like pairing the device taking ownership of this device and then configuring this device to become operational so we are we are currently working on on and these kinds of uh, uh, these kinds of work, and what we are looking uh, at EAP is can we use EAP methods to do this uh, device bootstrapping, including provisioning some uh, long term credential on on the device from uh, from the controller device itself. So, so can we have another slide, please? So uh, this is not the first time, uh, I mean, uh, first work uh, that tries to address this provisioning of credential uh, through EAP. We are aware of this uh, deep threads and uh, deep. So they they are like a, they they have some uh, they have uh, this pro provisioning credential provisioning system as well. So can I have another slide, please? So what we are looking at is like uh, using EAP as a mechanism uh, to enable peer configuration from from EAP uh, authentication server, uh, which can be used to provision credential as well as set some policies or do some configuration on the device. And we are trying to look at a simple, simplest possible solution from implementation and specification uh, point of view. So this is, as you all know, this is the generic EAP message flow. Uh, and if, we, if we look at here, we have some common uh, common messages, and then there there are messages going through, through uh, underlying EAP method. And when the EAP method completes, there's a common uh, success or failure message. What we want to add is, if we go to the next slide, we can. Add is a is the same similar kind of a request response message flowing from uh, server to the peer, which will include configuration messages, uh, and these configuration messages are only to be sent after completing underlying EAP method, but before sending the success, we still uh, are thinking like should this success message should depend on on the configuration response or, or should it only pure uh, or or only depend on EAP method itself like if EAP has EAP authentication has succeeded then then uh, even if the configuration messages messages fails they still get this EAP success message so this is uh, we haven't looked into into it so far so can we go two slides more so next slide is this one is more like uh, how this uh, uh, our config configuration layer sits on top of EAP layer and, and it simply uses EAP layer uh, as a way of com uh, of sending this configuration message parameter. So before uh, moving forward, we should think consider uh, some of the issues that we currently have. Like the EAP uh, by default does not support uh, this message fragmentation, so the simplest way would be to fit all the configuration messages in the uh, in the single single EAP message, uh, and that's this push versus pull model where currently there's there's a request flowing from server to the client, but can we have client requesting the configuration parameter from the server? Or so should should we uh, should we think we I mean we should think in in this direction as well, and there should be an, uh, a discovery mechanism where uh, where one endpoint will uh, figure out whether the other endpoint supports this configuration uh, messages at all or not. 
then uh, also about this configuration security of the configuration messages it could be based on EAP session key or it could be derived from from the uh, master session key or uh, X EMSK itself and uh, we should try to minimize this configuration probing uh, uh, and the number of EAP messages uh, going uh, total number of EAP messages that's being added. So, in the uh, in the next slide, please. Uh, we think like that there could be these following uh, approaches that we could use is to simply define a new uh, message type for configuration messages and this EAP for uh, EAP request and response messages that can be sent in either direction. Or uh, we use currently we, uh, EAP has this notification message type, so we could we could simply use this notification message type to send configuration messages, or define some sort of a new EAP method that use existing EAP tunneling method like EAP creds, and also should also think uh, we're also thinking like uh, there could be another configuration protocol that will begin after uh, that is independent of EAP, EAP altogether. So EAP will only, only set the necessary things to start another protocol after EAP session has ended. So there is need to be a mechanism to convey to the both side that there, there will be another protocol coming coming and and, uh, and we're thinking like maybe uh, there could be a session binding from between EAP session and, and the another uh, configuration protocol, for example, using some sort of a derived uh, shared secret from EAP, EAP session, which could be used to verify it in the, in the configuration protocol that will follow. So uh, we are actually, uh, we don't have a ready draft yet. We are just uh, here to see, uh, to get your viewpoint on, on this uh, matter. We have a we have a question in the queue. Do you want to take that now? Yes. Um, the next slide is just the ending slide. So yeah. Okay. All right, Elliot. Give me a button there. Hi, um, Sandy. Thanks. Hi. For your presentation. Um, could you go back to slide eight, please? Yes. This one. Um, so. Um, I think your thinking is very much along my own, um, with some exceptions, but this is what led me down the path towards T. First of all, the one of the reasons is that the long-term credential message is really already there. They're a little broken, as you heard early, earlier, but we're going to open that document up and clean that up. Um, so I, I, I definitely you know, the, the direction. On fragmentation, that's handled in the in the TLS layer with TEEP. So you sort of get that for free if, if we can sort if we can sort the other issues. Um, regarding the push pull model, um, that's worth exploring, but um, definitely the what you call push pull, I call lockstep. Um, and um, so we we're pretty much aligned on that point. The discovery mechanism um, is sort of um, built into TEEP as well in terms of how you handle a message that you don't understand. You just discard it. Um, and then it's up to the, or, or you don't, it's up to the to each side to decide whether they think it's important or not. Um, the, um, the rest of this, um, you know, I think probably you and I are probably within of each other in terms of trying to sort this stuff if we can if, if we can figure out the rest of the, the, the teep discussion and for that matter what a long-term credential is um, if we're going to open the, the teep document up for you know broader discussion we can certainly open it up to that to that question as well and we'd be interested in um, maybe working with you on that as we move forward All right, thanks. Uh, okay, we have a, do you have a response or? 
inshallah we'll definitely like to uh explore more in in deep as well so let's take another question at the moment yeah so Thomas has a question yeah, I wanted to comment on the push and pull question because the way I understand it is there is kind of, uh, uh, you can have uh, two kinds of device configuration. One is uh, kind of DHCP type request where the device has an opportunity to ask for specific configuration options and then the server responds to that. And then there could be just a kind of push where the server just tells everyone announces what to the device what is your configuration here it is and both of these result in slightly different communication patterns i think and the number of messages may differ and, and uh, then it comes to kind of how many round trips of traffic it creates uh, Mohit? Yeah, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, so um, I think my general suggestion is as little changes to EAP as possible for doing what you want. So if it's, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, perhaps uh, you could uh, look at TEEP as well, but if you want to configure other types of credentials or uh, then either like one or or three is better. Like I don't want like protocols like ACME and like many other uh, these these provisioning CMS, CMC, all that running over EAP because EAP is uh, often running over over the link layer. So uh, I like the idea of approach three that EAP finishes and you export a key from EAP that you then use in your favorite protocol, whether it's ACME or CMS or CM or, or, or whatever is, is your favorite protocol for provisioning and whatever type of credential you want to to provision. So it provides you like EAP, but then also doesn't like uh, tightly couple the provisioning protocol with the authentication protocol except the, the key. Or then one of, of the option one of just defining new message types so that like new implementations that support this message type would do what you want to do, but at least existing implementations are like not broken or don't have to change. Yes, we were also thinking about like uh, having a minimal set of uh, messages that could be used within a single frame or one or, one or a couple of messages that could be used for configuration and that's it. Or if, they, if there is a need that the configuration messages are going to be too long or provisioning messages are going to be uh, complicated, then have this simple way of the, conveying this message to the peer or both the endpoints that, okay, we are going to start another protocol and here are the primitives for, for this uh, new or input for the new protocols to start. Some way of indicating and, and extracting some sort of a, a shared secret. So my suggestion would be to think of what EAP method are you going to use for the actual authentication and then see whether that EAP method allows you to send whatever is the information you want to send. So uh, like, is, is there some field in that EAP method that allows you to send some, some small configuration data that will be used later in a separate protocol? But without like deciding on on the on which EAP method is used for authentication, it it becomes a little bit harder. That that's only a suggestion, though. So can't we have, have some sort of a general indication that we are starting this next uh, uh, protocol altogether, like sending. Uh, some sort of pay payload within this notification messages. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the, the reason why we like doing the full configuration in E is that it simplifies operations a lot. Um, for one reason is you don't have to set up tunneling and what have you in order to do the rest of the configuration 
and and manage auth authorization or authentication um, you know at a later stage it doesn't require that you have an, an l3 address uh, to do whatever additional configuration you need because you might need to do some configuration before you even get that um, so there's a, there's good reason to want to do that sort of stuff why T had it in the first place um, the the second point that I, I was going to say um, is that when you start to do um, other uh, uh, when you, when you start to point to things that are outside of Eve when you start to do that binding um, then you have to do the binding a across sessions b potentially across devices um, and so you 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 can introduce a lot more complexity. Um, in, in actually not putting stuff into heap. So we should be careful about, you know, exactly what layer we want to solve this. In. And I say this, be, you know, having seen um, attempts to do this with EST and other componentry, and, you know, I know what the, the, the operational layout is, and, you know, the access control functions get pretty ugly, particularly at L3. Okay, any other uh, questions? So Sandeep, I think, um, you know, there's some interest here. I suggest you get together with some of the people who commented and kind of work through some of the issues and see, you know, where, you know, what, what, what you can use with existing things and what, what we might want to do new. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'll definitely look at the, this how Heap is uh, going forward. And thank you for everyone for your valuable input. I hope to see you next time. All right. I think that's at the end of the agenda. We have a couple minutes. Is anybody up? Any other uh, comments? Or question. I have one quick question to the group and to you and Roman. We'll have a meeting in July. Should we request a session for July or is it too soon? And should we just do an interim later when things have progressed? What do people feel about that? I, from, from my point of view, I think we probably want to request a session. I think we have a couple documents that we're going to be trying to move forward. Um, they should hopefully have activity on on TEEP in in this in, in you know interim period, and um, uh, we'd be hopeful that we would have things to discuss. All right. Yeah, I concur with that. Yep. July sounds good then. This is Russ Yari. I sent you the reference. Well, thanks everyone. Um, Want to make sure everybody signs the the um, the blue sheets, the attendance sheets. It is uh, requested that you uh, provide your affiliation. I noticed some people had signed and not provide their affiliation, um, so please do. Um, other than that, uh, we'll chat again in July. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye, and be safe.